Our topic is, I am the vine, ye are the branches. In John chapter 15, in verse number 1, I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. In verse number 5, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. In all these wonderful allegories of the Lord and also the parables that He spoke, another form of illustration, whenever the Lord used something from nature or based on natural law, He never did contradict natural law. And in the beginning in Genesis chapter 1, we learn regarding every living thing, even the plants, Genesis 1, verses 11 and 12, that everything produced after its own kind. And certainly that would be true regarding the fruit born on the branches connected to the vine in John chapter 15. And so I want to begin by saying that this passage does not teach unity and diversity, but just the opposite. But the very nature of the teaching and the allegory, it destroys that false doctrine because all the fruit on those branches where Jesus is the vine and the disciples are branches would be of the same nature and the same kind. Whereas in the denominational world, the religious world at large, in sectarianism, there's all different kinds of varying contrary fruits. And so right off, we see according to the Lord's consistency in His teaching based on nature but with a spiritual meaning that it would not contradict natural law. And hence it would be in accord with Paul's word to the Philippians that you all walk by the same rule, that is, the same standard, which is the doctrine of Christ. And whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ he hath both the Father and the Son, according to Second John verse number 9. And then also, according to the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, His authority, we're all to speak the same thing. And there are to be no divisions among us. But we are to be of the same mind and the same judgment. 1 Corinthians 1, verse number 10. The Lord's allegory here also is in harmony with His prayer two chapters later when He prayed concerning His disciples that they all may be one, Father, as thou art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And also Ephesians 4, verse 3, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. The unity of the Spirit is the unity or oneness that the Spirit produces through His Word, the Word of God, which is the sword of the Spirit, Ephesians 6, 17. And when we follow the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit, we will fulfill the prayer of Jesus, that we will be one. That unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace will be produced. One important point that I gained from a very fine little book by Brother J. Gaddis Roy on the parables of Jesus, a point that he brought out in addition to others that um, I had found and studied on was the fact that not only do the branches depend on the Father who is the husbandman, the vine dresser, according to John 15.1, and not only do they depend on the vine, who is the source of life and vitality, Jesus Christ. But God is depending on the branches. 
God is depending on the branches, which represent individual disciples and followers of the Lord and members of the body of Christ, the church. And one reason I want to bring that in, I read something on Facebook uh, about three weeks ago where two brethren were demeaning the importance of lectureships and how that we all ought to be evangelizing and all that. And of course, we should be evangelizing. And the Lord is depending on us for that also. We know that's the case. But think about the allegory of the vine and the branches. The Father is depending on us to beautify the vineyard by the lives that we live and the fruit that we bear. And to bring glory to God, Ephesians 3.21, unto Him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. And let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Matthew 5 and verse number 16. Yes, God is depending on us to do the good, to let the beauty of Jesus Christ be seen in us as the branches that are a part of the vine, as people could see that power and beauty in Him. And so we are to have the mind of Christ Jesus within us, Philippians 2, verse 5. But going back to that discussion, this is one reason that brethren teach brethren. It's one reason that we edify one another when we come together on the Lord's Day or Wednesday night and in lectureships like this. If one's going to make the argument that really the only important work is evangelizing, and again it is important, but that's not all, then one will have to negate the importance of coming together and building up one another on the most holy faith. And so this idea that, you know, lectureships are a waste of time or other times that we study in depth God's Word is a false idea. When you look at the allegory of the vine and the branches, because in order for the Lord's vineyard to be healthy and produce fruit, it must be sound and healthy spiritually built up on God's holy word. Now, we can glean much from this great allegory on the vine and the branches. Jesus said, I am the true vine. Jesus Christ is the genuine and true source of life. In a vineyard, the vine is the source of life. The branches cannot have and maintain life apart from the vine. They cannot grow and bear fruit apart from the vine. We know this is true. And if a branch becomes severed from the vine or apart from the vine, we know even in our own yards that branch dies. It withers and dies. John 15, verse number 6 Jesus said, If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. The branch cannot live without the vine. And friends, we have a total dependence on Jesus Christ. Total dependence. We must never forget that. Jesus said, For without me ye can do nothing. John 15, verse 5. And we are going to look at individual responsibility as a branch on the vine as we study this lesson. But could it be that some of us have the idea that it all depends on us in the sense that we are not trusting in the Lord with all of our heart and not leaning on, and leaning on our own understanding? Where the wise man said, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. Paul said, I planted Apollos water, but God gave the increase. Are we totally dependent 
on the Lord? Yes, the Lord is depending on us. But we must trust in Him. We are not the source of life. Jesus Christ is. Jeremiah said, Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man that maketh flesh his heart, whose heart departeth from the Lord. Jeremiah 17, 5. In Jeremiah 10, 23, O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. But sometimes we pray as if we do not totally depend on the Lord. If we worry too much, that indicates that we don't appreciate what John 15, 5 says. If we worry and we want to put it all on man and ourselves, we must trust the Lord and do His will. It's our part to do God's will, but also we must trust in the Lord. Paul said, be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ, indeed, is the genuine source of life and vitality. It's not the Pope. It's not Mohammed. It's not Billy Graham. But we know that his tomb is full. It is not Martin Luther or Joseph Smith or not even any one of the great Bible characters, not Moses and not Peter, Paul, James, or John, as great as these men are. And we emulate them and look up to them and follow their godly ways. And not John the Baptist either. John chapter 1 said of Jesus, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And that there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That is the true light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. That is said of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So not even John the Baptist, as great as he was, is the source. But now secondly, consider that the father is the husbandman. One of the important points we want to get out of the lesson today is that the father as the husbandman and the vine dresser is continually working on his vineyard. And what that means is that He is continually working on us. Jesus said, My Father worketh hitherto, and I work. John 5, verse 17. God the Father is the vine dresser. You know that God had a vineyard in the Old Testament? It was Israel, the people of Israel. In Isaiah 5, in verse number 4, Jehovah God said, what could I have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes, wild grapes. We see wild grapes in the brotherhood today. We see the wild grapes of the false doctrine of the A.D. 70 doctrine. We see the wild grapes of the reevaluation and reaffirmation of elders' doctrine. The wild grapes of error on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. The wild grapes of nudity and immodesty that we talked about yesterday that is being condoned and defended at Fried Hardman. We see the wild grapes of fellowship error that even some that we thought for many years were sound in the faith have thrown in the white flag, the towel, and given up the truth on the doctrine of fellowship that the Bible teaches. What about the Lord's church today? Do we not see wild grapes 
and bad fruit being brought forth by many. Jesus warned in John 15 too, Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now let's think furthermore about God as being the husbandman, the vine dresser. God has planted His vineyard, the church. Jesus said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Everything that is unauthorized by God Almighty will come to ruin and be destroyed. One day, God is going to root it up. But we know one that will not be, and that is the church of our Lord. which Jesus said, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Matthew 16, verse 18. He's talking about His true church, not just a counterfeit of those who may put Church of Christ on the building, but those who are still the true Lord's church. That is the church founded on God's Word that God has planted. And this church can be planted in any community where the seed, the Word of God is sown, Luke 8, verse 11. And souls hear, believe, and obey it, and are born again, and are grafted into the vine. That engrafted Word, implanted Word, that James refers to, the Word of God that will save our souls, James 1, 21. It must be obeyed, verse 22. And when that happens, a soul is born again, and grafted into the vine, becomes a part of the vine, Jesus Christ. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. 1 Peter 1, 23. It is by obedience to the truth that souls are purged and cleansed and saved. Seeing ye have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit, unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another, with a pure heart, fervently, 1 Peter 1, verse 22. When a soul obeys the gospel of Christ, and I appreciate uh, uh, Brother Cohn mentioning the door knocking and the church here carrying that on, we need to go out and sow the seed of the kingdom. That is ever so important. How else could souls are lost obey the gospel and be grafted into the vine, Jesus Christ? and have the life and the hope of eternal life that we enjoy. Paul said, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Galatians 3.27 That's how people come into the vineyard of the Lord, the church, God's husbandry, the building of the Lord. 1 Corinthians 3.9 Because 1 Corinthians 12.13 says, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. That's the church according to 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. That's how we are grafted into the vine, Jesus Christ, and into the vineyard of God, His husbandry, the Lord's church. Jesus said, in accord with 1 Corinthians 12, 13, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. One is born of the Spirit when this implanted Word, the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit, is in his heart and he obeys it. And then he goes in the waters of baptism in obedience to the gospel. And he comes into Christ and added by the Lord to the church. As members of the body of Christ, we have a unique relationship with the Father and with the Son. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse number 1, Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus, unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. The true church is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Does this not work in harmony with the Lord's teaching here? that the branches are in the vine, Jesus Christ, and in the vineyard of God, the Heavenly Father, indeed it is. 
My dear friends, today as we know, there are people who are laboring diligently in the wrong vineyard. They're in the wrong religious body. And Jesus describes on the judgment day what will happen with those individuals. In Matthew 7, beginning at verse 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works. Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I'd like to go over at this time in Matthew chapter 20 and verse number 1. This is the parable of the householder or the vineyard. And we're only going to read one verse here. It's a great parable. But Jesus said, For the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is a householder, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. The householder who went out to hire laborers is the Lord. He went out early in the morning. That's because kingdom business is urgent business. Early in the morning. It's the most important. And we are to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Matthew 6, verse 33. And love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Mark 12, verse 30. But He went out early in the morning to hire laborers. There's no place in the kingdom for a lazy man. Paul said, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. I read a story one time about a man who moved from the country into town, and he gave each one of his neighbors a big bag of wheat seed. He came back a, a year later to visit in the neighbors, and he passed by one of them and there where they lived, and there was a big field of gleaming golden grain. And he went by the others, and the field was all grown up with weeds. And he asked the man, what did you do with that bag of wheat seed? He said, well, I put it in the attic, and the rats ate it. Now, that sounds just about like some of my brethren. That's about how lazy some of them are. They don't appreciate the good seed. They don't appreciate what God gives them. They are described here in John 15 as those that don't bear fruit, and therefore they are severed from the vine. But the householder went out to hire laborers early in the morning in his vineyard. He didn't go out to hire them into man's vineyard or churches established by men or religious organizations that men have founded. He went out to bring them into his vineyard. But then Jesus said, I am the vine, ye are the branches. Ye are the branches. The branches represent individual followers of Christ, disciples of the Lord. One of the important points here is that each branch sustains a relationship to the vine. It's not just collective, it is individual. Each individual branch sustains a relationship with the vine. And hence Paul would write, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Philippians 2 verse 12. You know what some people say about that? Well, you can just come up with your own plan to serve the Lord and just work that plan out. No, that's not what it means. It means you work out your own salvation with trim, fear and trembling. You, as an individual, have a responsibility to do the Lord's work yourself. No one can do it for you. We may love and appreciate the godly elders here, the godly preacher, and we should or wherever we are, but they can't do our work for us. Or the faithful deacons, they can't do it. Or a godly wife, or a faithful husband, they can't 
serve the Lord for us. A faithful mommy and daddy, mother and father, they can't go to heaven for us. Even if we're young Christians, very young, we each have a responsibility to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Because every one of us, each branch, every one of us, should give account of himself unto God. Romans 14, verse 12. But also in this allegory of the vine and the branches, the branches do not and simply cannot represent religious bodies or denominations. That's what the denominational world puts on this allegory. That's what they say it teaches. That Christ is divine and He has all these branches out here, all these denominations, and thus denominationalism and sectarianism is justified by John 15. Well, that's a false doctrine. It's not even logical when you look at the passage here. For example, in John 15, verse 5, Jesus said, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. That's a personal pronoun, singular, he. That's an individual. And then he said at the end of the verse, For without me ye can do nothing. He that abideth in me and I in him. There's an individual. Also, verse number 6, If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. So the branch is a man. And it is a man, a human being, who follows the Lord, a disciple of the Lord. That's what a branch in the vine is here and what it represents. We know that not only is Christ the true vine and the Father is the true husbandman, but those branches that belong to Christ, members of the church, the Lord's church, are the only true branches. They are the only true branches. Those in false religions, or those who have gone astray from the church, or those who have never become a part of Christ, they simply cannot be the branches here. Members of the Lord's church are the true branches. The faithful members of the church, because remember, the unfaithful will be cut off and wither and die. Jesus said, Let them alone. They be blind followers of the blind. And if the blind follow the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. Matthew 15, verse 14. But also we know here that each branch, each disciple, is responsible for spiritual growth and fruit bearing. Look at the divine order in this passage. It is fruit, more fruit, and then much fruit. John 15, verse 2. Every branch of me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, there is fruit. He purgeth it that it may bring forth more fruit. There is more fruit. But then verse number 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. That's the divine order. Spiritual growth. Fruit, more fruit, and much fruit. As we think about this today, beloved friends, in the last year, have I begun to bear more fruit? What about two years ago? Was I more fruitful than I am today? Or three years ago? Or five or ten years ago? We are to examine ourselves, 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Are we bearing more fruit now than we were before? Are we stronger in the Lord than ever? If not, then we have stopped growing. In Christ, we're either going forward and we're growing in the Lord, or we're bearing more fruit or we're slipping backwards. I'm afraid that some of us are like the people of Judah that Jeremiah described. Thou hast gone backward and not forward. Jeremiah 7 verse 24. You haven't gone forward. You haven't grown closer to God and done more for Him, but rather you have gone backward. As Brother Michael brought out a while ago in his excellent lesson, 
that we are to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and forever. Amen. 2 Peter 3 and verse 18. But now, my friends, in the last part of our lesson for a few minutes, let's consider some other great lessons. First of all, what is fruit bearing? A while ago we talked about the Lord's church here going out to evangelize this next Saturday. And of course, all of us need to do that for the Lord. To go out, try to win souls, to help the fallen, the suffering, the weak, to restore the erring, to help those in need, to teach the lost, to try to get Bible studies and whatever work we can do for the Lord. And to build up and encourage and help one another, to comfort the afflicted, and those who are grieving and suffering, so many things we can do. But what is fruit bearing? I, we need to understand what that means. Jesus Christ is the great example of bearing fruit for God that ever walked this earth. In John 8, 29, we have an example of bearing fruit, although he did not mention fruit bearing in that verse. He said, He that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone for I do always those things that please Him. Friends, that's bearing fruit for the Lord. Amen. Doing the things that please the Lord. My bearing fruit and my connection with the vine, Jesus Christ, is not dependent upon the reception of a hard-hearted person that doesn't want the truth. I may go out and labor diligently to teach the lost. And how many times have we done this? And maybe have a Bible lesson two or three, and just people turn you off just like that. I've been through that many times. Thought we were going to convert somebody. But they just turned the truth off. They didn't want it. Is God going to say, well, you didn't bear fruit there because you didn't convert that person? Well, think about Jesus Christ. Look at how many people began to hate him and who did not obey him did not follow him although he gave them every good reason to do so does that mean that he did not please the father in what he did absolutely not fruit bearing in short is to do the will of God now we can prove that by verses 9 and 10 of this passage here let's look at that John 15, verse 9 and 10. Jesus said, As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in His love. Can you imagine anyone abiding in God's love who would be disconnected from the vine? who would not abide in the vine. Jesus said in verse 4, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. Well, here in verses 9 and 10, he teaches that to abide in his love, we must keep his commandments. That's another way of saying to abide in me. Because... To abide in the Lord's love is to abide in Christ. And the way to do that is to keep His commandments. Another verse along this line is 1 John 2, 3. John said, And hereby we do know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. We can know the Lord and we can know that we know the Lord if we keep His commandments. To know the Lord is to abide in Him. It is a knowing right relationship with the vine, Jesus Christ, to know the Lord. But also, along this matter of fruit bearing, there is more than one reason we need to bear fruit. Not only to avoid being severed from the vine, as verse 2 teaches. And by the way, this passage refutes the false doctrine of the impossibility of apostasy. Notice what Jesus says here. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. 
Well, a lot of times the people that teach once saved, always saved, or you can't fall from grace, they say, well, if you fail, you never really belong to the Lord in the first place. That's not what Jesus says. Every branch in me, that branch is in me that the Father takes away because it ceases to bear fruit. It is in me. And thus the possibility of apostasy or falling away is taught here. But we need to bear fruit not only to avoid being severed from the vine, the life-giving vine, but also, verse 8, Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. There's another reason that we need to bear fruit, to glorify God the Father. But then there's a third reason. Look at the latter part of that verse. So shall you be my disciples. That is, in bearing much fruit, you will be my disciples. You will truly be my, fo my followers. But then there's another reason. Verse 11. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. What have you been talking about? Abiding in the vine. Bearing fruit in the Father's vineyard. Bearing fruit. Do we want to have the Lord's joy and to continue to have that joy? Jesus teaches you must bear fruit. You know, in the Lord's church, if you want to find the happy people, the joyful people, find the people that are working for the Lord. That's who the joyful people are. And Jesus taught that in John 13, 17, after washing his disciples' feet. He said, happy are, if you know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. But then there's another important principle here, and that is, the purging and pruning process. This is a horticultural principle to prune the, van the branches. Look at that in verse 2. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Well, why, Lord, why purge a branch that is already bearing fruit? Why? So that it will bear more fruit. Is that not true in horticulture? that branches are pruned and trimmed back although they are bearing fruit? What's the purpose of that? So that too much of the life of the vine will not go into the branch itself, but will go into the fruit. That's true in horticulture. If you don't prune that branch back, it will weaken the fruit bearing. Too much of the life of the vine will go into the branch and not enough into the fruit. And I think before we close here, Charlotte, it's important that we look at this a moment because I believe that we all can relate to this matter of being purged and being pruned, as it were, as a branch. Do you ever wonder why I go through some of the things I go through? It seems like the harder I try to do right, the more I go through. What did the Hebrews 12, 6 say? For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. The Lord has a way of molding us and making us after his will by scourging and chastening and correcting us. We know also that the word of God is involved in this process. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, that is, complete, thoroughly furnished, unto every good work, or under all good work, 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17. God's Word not only encourages us, but it corrects us. And we as humans, oh, how many times do we as humans need that correction? It doesn't matter how faithful we are as gospel preachers or elders, or how long we've been in the church, we always need the Lord's help in getting to heaven. Remember what we said earlier. The Father is the husband. He is continually working on His vineyard. He's working on us, beloved. He's working on us. Thou art the potter, we are the clay. Isaiah 64, 8, to Jehovah God. 
But then briefly, before we close, we see here also the importance of the Word of God. This refutes a direct operation of the Holy Spirit doctrine. What did Jesus say here in John 15, 3? Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. And we have those teaching today that one may be sanctified in some way apart from God's word. Apart from God's word by the direct operation of the Holy Spirit. But Jesus said, You are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Yes, the Holy Spirit is involved because the word of God is the sword of the Spirit. Ephesians 6, 17. The Spirit works through the Word. The power of God's Word. The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two edged sword, piercing even dividing son and soul and spirit, the joints of the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Hebrews 4, 12. There's power in God's Word. It's not a dead letter. Jesus said, The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Jesus said, If ye abide in me, and my words abide in me, you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Verse 7. Yes, you must abide in me, but my words must abide in you. And yes, you must abide in me, but as Brother Guy in Woods points out, that we also must let the Lord abide in us. As he said, we must imbibe his spirit and live holy by his word. In Romans 8 and 9, Paul said, If any man have not the spirit of God, he is none of his. Yes, Christ must be seen in us, my beloved friends. As we close in Galatians 2.20, Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. You know, the Spirit gave that word crucified to Paul by inspiration. That wasn't Paul's choosing. The Spirit guided him in what he wrote. Crucifixion is a long, lingering Process, sacrificial. That describes the Christian life and our spiritual growth. That describes how that Christ abides in us. We must die to self, to sin, and the world. We must be crucified with Christ. There's no other way that Christ may be seen in us. No other way that the Son of God may live in us. Yes, beloved, we must get self out of the way. That's one of the hardest things that we have to do, is to get self out of the way in order to be a part of the true vine and to be a true branch. As we extend the invitation this morning, it is an urgent matter to become a part of the vine, Jesus Christ. One time there was a preacher who labored diligently to convert a 15-year-old boy to Christ. It was said on that Lord's Day evening, the 15-year-old boy obeyed the gospel. Within 24 hours, he had suffered an accident on the farm and lost his life. The mother called the preacher to do the funeral. And she asked the preacher this question. She said, what if this had happened a week earlier? What if it had happened a week earlier? And friends, we need to think about that. If you're not a part of the vine, Jesus Christ, this morning, we encourage you upon hearing and believing the gospel, Romans 10, 17, upon repentance, Acts 2, 38, confessing Jesus Christ, the Son of God, go into the waters of baptism for the remission of sins and come up out of the water, go on your way rejoicing. Go down in sin, come up in Christ. Romans 6, 3 and 4, Acts 8, 37 to 39. Go on your way rejoice. Have you done this, my friend, but you realize today that I'm one of those branches that God has removed because I have ceased to bear fruit. I have ceased to do His will. 
And this morning, I need to come back to return to my first love, to repent and pray God's forgiveness, Acts 8, 22. If this be your need, would you not come while we stand and we sing together?